Thank you, Hamish. You know, this is a group of friends, and I think when you speak to a lot of different people, you like them not to know who you are, because then they don't have any idea whether you know anything or not, right? Unfortunately, in this room, there are a lot of people that know more about what I do than I do. Um, and they've done many, many things that I haven't done in this work. And obviously, what we've seen so far today in terms of the presentations has demonstrated that. But I, I want to thank uh, DSF 7 for inviting me here. I got to come a couple of years ago, and I, you know, didn't expect to come back for at least five more, but uh, it worked out. Um, Eleven years ago this summer, we came to the Elon Valley because this wild, crazy man named Daniel Meadows had come visiting us at, at, in Berkeley and brought this idea back to some people at BBC uh, here in Wales. Um, Daniel just told me he's retiring. So I want to just say to the man that brought CDS to Wales, that brought digital storytelling to Wales, a deep uh, grateful thank you, and happy retirement, brother. I'm glad you're out of that academic hellhole that you've been in for many years. Now, I came to London to do a workshop this weekend kind of at an odd time. You know, I can't say I'm uh, a royalist. I don't think that's fair to say. Most Yankees are not royalists. There are some Anglophiles who love the queen. I come from San Francisco, where we like our queens a bit different. <laughs> but it was great. I got to do a workshop this weekend uh, in the context of that Jubilee celebration. And we were starting at this little bar. And I haven't taught in a bar in a while. This is the George Inn, which is the oldest, what do they call it? Like liveried or, you know, yeah, galleried uh, pub in London. And people were drinking outside the whole time. And I can say people like Tony Sumner, who's here from Patient Voices, was actually dr drinking all the way through the workshop. It was an amazing. <laughs> uh, we haven't had that experience before, but that was very English. And we thought it was great because we're here for the summer of this great promotional effort. Here was one of the signs promoting the London Olympics. I, I, I hadn't heard of this particular event, but I noticed this guy was checking out the specifications. So. It was kind of wild. But we had one story that came out of that. And I always, people say, well, what, you know, what's your favorite story? And it's usually a story I just heard, because I can't remember many of the stories <laughs> a week or a year or whenever after I've done a workshop. So I'm going to start with one of the stories that came out of that that I think expresses my own feelings about this kind of contradictory impulse to be celebratory around something like where you come from which seems obvious, and, uh, and the history of that place, and all the hoopla around it. I pushed a bugaboo across London fields, full of mums with matching fucking pushchairs, and I dropped Zinnia at the Montessori. I drink a predictably perfect soil flat white from a coffee shop full of beautiful fucking people, and feel totally numb in the comfort of it all. I miss the provocative grit and dysfunction that makes people see through the propaganda and flags, and the comfort does not seem so comfortable anymore. Mm. Mm. I didn't really want to stop it. I forgot that there was a little prelude. Oops, 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 now I have to move on. Anyway, you saw the queen waving. She was cute, that waving plastic queen. You know, there are many different shades of stories. We've begun work recently with a woman named Arlene Goldbard, who I suggest you read her blog at arlengoldbard.com. Um, she's one of our leaders in the United States around community cultural development. And as she suggests in this quote, that many different shades of stories, if they were to be seen and felt in a kind of awareness that History Pen, I think, is, is wishing to do. And it would be lovely if we had all of the stories and all of the different connections that exist inside this room, inside the streets outside of 
here at the Charter House, if we could capture just a small sense of the living memory of all these communities, that it would mean the democracy that we would live in would value each and one, every one of these stories the same. There would be not just the triumphal stories that get played over four days of BBC's coverage of the Jubilee, but there would also be stories of the people that are trying to work through this very terror-filled time of concern about our economic future and the stability of our uh, countries and uh, the ability of our young people to imagine a future that they can own. All of those stories would be shared equally, and in the balance of that, perhaps we would find a degree of meaning. Our work uh, at the center is, is about a lot of things, but it clearly it's inspired by the idea that communities should own their own stories and should be able to share those stories in the way they want to amongst the people they want to, and that may mean a general public, but it also may be in the sacred spaces of their own communities' um, ways of understanding and knowing each other. I thought today, rather than, um, you know, kind of talk a lot about what's going on and what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera, that I would focus, because so many people in the room now are actually active digital storytelling facilitators, to focus a little bit more on that process. However, I thought, because last time I was here, I was asked immediately after my presentation, what does CDS do? And I thought I would at least give the requisite commercial before I jump in. So this is a requisite commercial that will last exactly 20 seconds. 18 years ago, we got started been all over the place, work like hell in a lot of different areas, and have a really great time. Okay, that took care of that. <clears throat> um, in our minds, this process, and, and this metaphor may seem stretched, extreme for some of you, that the idea that every story is like a child being born, but certainly the feeling of working with people closely in any of these community contexts where you know something's locked up inside of somebody and they're being able to share it for the first time, certainly it feels like this. And the sense of responsibility as well as the kind of joyful act of the mystery of it uh, does feel like a miracle when we're sharing these stories. And we approach it like every story is a miracle, and we should work as hard for any individual that walks through our process or walks into a community program that we're helping to support as if every story counts, that no one gets left behind. Everyone is going to finish or none of us are going to finish. And with that in mind, we've been able to kind of build up a, a strong sense of, of meaning around our work in, a, in the facilitative arts. So I want to tell this story. Um, it's really from my colleague Daniel Weinschenker, who runs our Denver office and who does uh, one of the two intensive uh, facilitative training workshops we do. We call them facilitator intensive. And last year in Colorado, he was in a workshop that's not unusual for us. You know, the people that can afford our open workshops, we offer these workshops that anybody can come to in several cities in the United States and once in a while in other parts of the world. Um, they're usually sent by their institution, meaning it's often an academic institution, sometimes it's a public health institution or some other government agency. But very few individuals that end up being drawn to our work can afford to show up. And when they show up, they have a story that they want to tell that validates why they're there. And if they're sent by their boss, then it, it's something about what they do. And a young woman named Wynne Maggie came with the idea that she was going to tell a very official story about her academic work as an anthropologist in Pakistan. And she presented it to the story circle and the group of trainers to be, and as Daniel said, he noticed many of their eyes rolled, and maybe his did as well, because it was a, a kind of classic feeling that the person that was telling you what they were telling you really weren't interested in what they were saying, even though it was their profession. It was as if they were just doing some exercise of sharing, something that they knew and that they knew they should do. And in CDS, we talk about listening deeply, and we say, 
in these situations, it's hard to listen deeply because you feel so detached. But what the group had done that Daniel reported was when she finished, they all just stopped. And they waited. And instead of asking her a question or saying anything to her, they just stopped. And he said, you could hear the sounds of the farm outside where we hold the retreat. In, it may have been a minute or it may have been two minutes. And suddenly, wind just broke down and started crying. And when she stopped, she said, well, or I could tell this story. I was supposed to be an observer. When I first came to the Kalasha Valleys in northern Pakistan to conduct PhD dissertation research on Kalasha women's culture, I was stunned by the din and buzz of daily life in this small pastoral place. I taped it on my state-of-the-art cassette recorder, thinking no one would believe me otherwise. But when I came home two years later and played it to astonish my friends and colleagues, I didn't hear chaotic noise anymore. I heard the very particular words and voices of individual men, women, and children who had become real to me. Even though I was especially interested in observing their bashali, the communal menstrual house where women went when they were menstruating and to give birth, I'd never actually held a newborn before. I waited anxiously for the birth of Talim Khan and Nana's child. When the time came, together with the midwife, we walked the half mile up valley to the Bashali in the middle of the night, our way lit by little torches of resin-soaked wood. The birth was quick. The baby boy was big and healthy. The midwife cut the cord, swaddled him up, and then made a special sweet cream of wheat porridge for Talim Khan and Nana. All night, we Bashali women, even me, took turns holding the baby around the fire while his mother slept. Talim Khan and Nana said I was his aunt and said I should have a baby girl and then we would marry our children and we'd be called to bar. I documented the many rituals and visitations that happen in babies' first weeks of life as they are blessed and welcomed into the community. Then, about a week after mother and child came home, he got sick. With the help of my now worn copy of Where There Is No Doctor, I decided that he had pneumonia. A penicillin shot would likely cure him, the book said. Boys from the neighborhood raced to find the only young man in the valley with keys to the dispensary, but he had gone to the high pastures and was several hours away. The other women from Chet Guru took turns walking around with the baby. But sometimes I was the one holding him. And in between his heaving breaths, he was so still, so blue. Look, I said, let's take him to Chitral. There's a jeep in the bazaar, let's go. But Talim Khan and Nana said she wanted to wait for her husband to come home. Surely he would come home soon, and then he would come with me to take the baby. I said we should go now. I said I would pay for the jeep. I would pay for the hospital. She said, surely he'll come. Let's wait. I was 26, just married, didn't have kids, didn't even know how to bake a cake. But I realized that I could have taken that baby with or without his mother and gone to Chitral, she would have let me. They all would have let me. But I didn't. Instead, I sat outside on the ground and held the baby as the other women, one by one, went home to tend to their own children. One last huge gasp for breath ended in stillness. I don't remember what happened exactly after that, but someone took the dead baby from me and sent me home. I didn't write about this, or the funeral that followed, or even the birth in any of my work. I finished my dissertation, published a book, but after my daughters were born, I never went back to the field. You know, Daniel tells the story that 
after she told her story, she said, you know, I've never told anyone that before. And I thought about the role that we have um, in listening and that kind of being able to hold something sacred in a space that allows, you know, stuff that we bury inside ourselves about our lives to, to just emerge. It's been discussed that CDS's approach is, you know, kind of borders on therapy, and I, I don't know that it borders on therapy. I, I think it, it's in a discussion of some spectrum of human behavior that's very old uh, about um, what it takes for different people sitting in the same room to trust each other at the deepest level. And, and that somebody invented psychology 120, 30 years ago, gave it a name and talked about it as if it's some fancy new idea. Uh, isn't the point. I think any time a group of us are given the opportunity to listen and we hold space with our hearts fully open, we can change ourselves and other people completely. We can change our lives. And the story work has for me that opportunity to bring that kind of change into individuals that then can manifest itself and change in the larger society. But it comes with a kind of understanding. I took this self-portrait, uh, yeah, Tuesday morning after drinking way too much on Monday night. I just want to share this. This is what it looks like. <laughs> and I realized, you know, I don't look that different now. But believe me, I feel better. I, I've stayed off of the hard stuff since then. Um, but in our work, I say these are the four lessons I've learned the most. And the hardest one for a person like me, who's overly opinionated and has a sense of self that, you know, is uh, privileged, is that I actually don't know other people's stories. And that when I listen, I can't listen as if I know how they should tell their story, even though I might try to give them suggestions. I should just listen. And that's the one part of the work that I know I can trust, is that holding of a moment where I'm just present. I'm just doing whatever I can to put every idea outside of my mind except what I'm hearing this person say to me, the way they look, the way they feel, what's implicit and what's not said, what's implicit in the way their body shifts so that when there's that little stick in a voice that you know they've just touched the hot button of the narrative that I can remember to say, well, when you said that, what was that about? And when you do that, people will respond. And then in working as a creative person with them, the trick is how to get them to tell that story the way they said it. I was trained as a playwright. I like to put words in people's mouths. But the idea of doing that in this work is, is inappropriate and unwise, even though it's easy to sort of say, wouldn't you rather say it like that? You have to think, no, nah, it's not my story. And finally, when you're doing the assistance, you try as best you can to not leave fingerprints. Admittedly, any collaborative process in which some person is very experienced, collaborates with somebody who's not so experienced, it e makes it very easy to leave fingerprints on the work that you're doing. And I think in these collaborative arts, we need to find ways to be conscious of when we have shaped the story, when somebody says to us, oh, I couldn't have done that without you you've left your fingerprint. In working towards this, we've identified these as the facilitative skill set that a group of people need to bring into the room in some grouping of facilitative leaders. It doesn't mean one person would have all these skills, but hopefully one or two or three would have a large number of these that allows you to move through this complicated process at a high, high level of uh, professional, professionalism and, and kind of consciousness. Uh, I order them in the way that I think they're important. The human and communication skills lead us into the organizational and lastly the technical skills. Being able to do all these things over whatever time-based process that you've given yourself, whether it's a, a five-day or a three-day or a one-day or a half-day a workshop process, you're going to need to look at all of these skills. But we also realize that it's not like we're talking about a singular audience. And so we've also done some work thinking, and I use the herding cats commercial. I love this commercial and these old cowboys herding a bunch of cats. Um, 
for what the process is as we meet the different kinds of people that are likely to walk in the room. Many of us are involved in processes where the audience is captured. That's called public school. They can't get away. They didn't ask to be there to do the digital storytelling project. Or they've been signed up by somebody that says they have to be there. And in those situations, it's a very different approach to how you're going to help people work with the stories. And the degree of collaboration goes up exactly in relationship to that need. And the fact that they need to learn that they might have liked to have been in the workshop before they get excited about the thing that they will uh, be doing. I think one of the fabulous things about the Capture Whales model is that it allowed time for creative play at the beginning of the process to allow a group of people who frankly did self-select but in a sense might have had a lot of uh, borders to cross about their sense of, of being a published author in, in relationship to the BBC allowed them to work through processes and prompts to learn how to hear each other and also l learn how to play with language and find the story that resonated with their colleagues in the workshop. The what am I supposed to do, I'm supposed to do what, is, is more typically the people we get, that they don't uh, feel that confident about any parts of the process, but particularly writing, and that they may have a kind of, I already know what I would do, what is called cliched uh, approach, in the, only in the sense that they may not have thought about the possibilities of their creative voice in that context. And as you move across this, and I won't spend that much time on this, but as you move across this, you get into an other area of work. And those of you who work with academics or work with professionals like yourself trying to get them to tell stories, you know, Sometimes the people who need the most love are the people who are the most confident. I'm not sure why that is, but people come in with a kind of fixed idea that they're already creatives. I've worked with a lot of filmmakers who will sit in the workshop and not be able to move because they're so afraid to do something simple. And they're afraid of what it exposes about themselves. Or they're in some ways just used to pointing the camera in a different direction as opposed to toward themselves. And if you give them the most love and the most assistance in the sense of encouragement, you often get them to crack out of that uh, process. But by you know, the other side, if you fail to connect with them, inevitably you find yourself in a situation where they're the one that re remains hurry up to get done at the last part of the process. Again, I know I'm t talking to some of you, again, <laughs> as people who've done some of this work and have an idea of this. If you haven't done much of this work, I think this is relevant to any in human engagement process, is to think about the different kinds of people that come in and what you need to do to adjust uh, the ways of doing it. So with this done, I want to spend a little bit of my uh, remaining time uh, talking about two projects. One is the iPhone workshops that we're doing and give you an overview to what we're trying to do with that. And the second is to talk about, I want to show something off the iPhone of an app that we did as a distribution app, not a, a creation app, um, for a project we did in Canada. So the first um, project I'll talk about is the iPhone workshop. Uh, all of us are aware that the iPhone, you know, this is heavily expensive smartphone, has gotten a pretty big distribution. It's made Apple that much a richer company, and uh, the apps that are being developed for it are in the millions, right? It's, so many things are going on, it's hard to keep up with. But we were reasonably impressed by last year that the editing suite on the iPod, iPod, iPod iPhone, iPad uh, tools were good enough to begin teaching. And we've had a demonstration this morning of an iPad-based video editing project using iMovie. So we were looking at iMovie and Splice, and we were also kind of experimenting with photography. But the God's honest truth is after 18 years of doing this work inside little rooms where I go to beautiful places and I never see them, I just wanted a workshop where I got the hell out of a workshop space, you know? So I went for these walks so far in Barcelona and Istanbul and London and Ohio. But I'll show you just how it works through a little story I made at the end of the uh, Istanbul workshop. Or 
not. It's been so good so far, it would be hard to imagine that it's... Well, we'll soon find out. And now I look behind the screen. Oh, I hate that thing. Oh, we've seen it, haven't we? Let's re-import it. Oh, I hate that thing. Don't you love using your time? This is how you import a movie <laughs> into PowerPoint for any of you who haven't done that so far. So where's the desktop? Okay, you can find my stick. No, it was off my stick because I copied it off my stick. So is it all on the desktop? Yeah, it was all on the desktop, but it might have been linked. So you have the DS7 yeah. and then Carter's presentation, yeah. and it, the one that it should be is. His combo. Now, why is it displaying? We'll soon find out. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> no, not there. Come on. <laughs> Down there. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm <laughs> you want to give this rest of the speech for me? <laughs> no, okay. Let's try that again. Okay, here's the idea. You get about a dozen people together in Istanbul to tell stories about place, about their lives, with Istanbul as the backdrop. Then you say you have one tool, the iPhone. So you take pictures using the Hipstamatic app, and then you edit and splice a real director. You start next to the arch of the old university. Then you head out to the park then to the bazaar. Then you hold your first story circle in the bazaar in a tea house that has served weary shoppers for at least 500 years. Then you wander down into alleys and markets by the river. And then slowly cross the bridge as the sun sets, just in time to take a tram up through a tunnel, and then end with a dinner by the tower. The next day, you form your second circle to work with your stories in a cafe by the Bosphorus. You follow that with ferry rides from one side of the Bosphorus to the other, returning under the mosque for a nice, quick fish sandwich and you snap photo after photo like crazy. And then you've got a few hours left to join the circle back together to edit like there's no tomorrow. And voila, the Istanbul iPhone digital storytelling workshop. So what I want to do, and the reason I showed that is I'm offering, this is a special offer for whoever gets the second drawing, you have a place in the Rio de Janeiro workshop next November. I will hold a place for you in the workshop. You just get yourself to Rio and you're in. So that's a, and it's worth something. I'm going to switch metaphors. to do something I haven't done before, which is present directly off an iPhone. <coughs> I've done it off the iPad, but this is a first. So any luck at all? <coughs> this, worked, this worked in preview. Ta-da! Isn't that wonderful? So, as I was saying, the work that we've been doing looking at the iPhone wasn't just using it as a tool, but also looking at it as a distribution mechanism. And in a big project we did with Volunteer Toronto and Toronto, Canada, um, we were able to gather stories and then have a designer work with us to create uh, what's called shared time app. So I'm hoping all of you will download this app, all of you that happen to have iPhones. 
And the way it works is that you have um, a classic pen structure for communicating about uh, the different stories. And the stories are all about a given organization and a given volunteer's experience in the organization. But the idea is it's pushing people in the direction of continuing to volunteer with the organization. And the idea is, you know, by choosing a pen, uh, you can go to a given story, he said with such confidence. That's what happens to old guys. There you go. And then you can get the story, and we'll see if it will load quick enough to play. There wasn't a person alive that could resist Mum's smile. One of her favorite party songs, which she loved to sing after her second Ryan Ginger, was Hello, Dolly. Mom adored children. She had a weekly order of iced gingerbread men, which she handed out to the neighborhood kids. Mom taught grade four for 33 years. At her funeral, past students in their 60s came to honor her. One man told me how mom used to visit. And we just ran out of bandwidth. Yeah, that's long enough. I'm actually going to, I never stop stories, but today I'm going to because I want to get through this little bit of the demo. The idea here is that uh, once you've seen the story, then you can link to the organization that the story is connected to. Obviously, this is a healthcare center which helped the woman. Uh, also, in looking at the story, um, you can go down and uh, explore the script if you want so you can get a sense of uh, the piece of writing that was there. And, you know, our idea is to continue to do these kinds of iPhone-based projects over the next uh, years as yet another way that people will find themselves into this. Uh, obviously, using iPhones to watch videos or iPads um, has some disadvantages as well as advantages, but we like the idea that this becomes yet another publishing platform for uh, the digital storytelling community. And we're obviously interested in, in collaborating with people who are interested in this particular kind of work. So with that said, I wanted to leave some time for questions, thoughts, ideas uh, coming out of this group. I think I have about 10 minutes left, is that correct? Less than 10? Yeah. So thank you for listening to that part of the presentation.